Good morning and welcome to the Vermont House Human Services Committee. Uh, today is Thursday, April 8th, and this morning um, we are beginning our um, uh, testimony uh, on JRH6, uh, a joint resolution relating to racism as a public health emergency. Um, clearly an important um, and very current uh, issue. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Legislative Council, Katie McLinn, uh, do, uh, doing a walkthrough of the resolution for us. The resolution was sent to the committee to be treated as a bill. So if you have questions about that process, uh, please direct it to Legislative Council as well. Katie. Good morning. Good morning. Katie McLinn, Office of Legislative Council. I will pull the document up on my screen. There we go. Are we, are we all seeing the same document? Yes, I'm seeing some nods. Okay, great. So this is Joint House Resolution Number 6, um, relating to racism as a public health emergency. And I'll go through each of the whereas clauses with the committee to start with. Whereas stark and persistent health inequities exist in the United States based on race, and that are caused by systemic racism. And whereas systemic racism is a principal social determinant of individual and public health, impacting economic, employment, education, housing, justice, and health opportunities and outcomes, all of which further adversely impact the health of people of color. And whereas the COVID-19 pandemic is now exasperating these inequities, and Black and Latino people in the United States have been nearly three times as likely to die. And whereas these same inequities exist in Vermont and during the pandemic, though Black residents comprise just over 1% of Vermont's population, they account for approximately 4.8% of the total confirmed COVID-19 cases as of December 16th, 2020. And whereas research and experience demonstrate that Vermont residents experience barriers to the equal enjoyment of good health based on race and ethnicity. And whereas the incidence rate of COVID-19 for non-white Vermonters is 74.2 um, versus 26.2 for white Vermonters. And specifically the incidence rate for black Vermonters is 225.7. And the incidence rate for Asian Vermonters is 61, and the incidence rate for Hispanic Vermonters is 41.7, and the incidence rate for other races is 20.5. And whereas, while there is not statistically significant differences in the rates of pre-existing conditions such as diabetes, lung disease, and cardiovascular disease among white and non-white Vermonters, there are disparities in the rates of pre-existing conditions among Vermonters testing positive for COVID-19 which suggests that non-white Vermonters are at higher risk of exposure to COVID-19 due to their type of employment and living arrangements. And whereas 36% of non-white Vermonters had household contact with a confirmed case of COVID-19 as compared to only 20% of white Vermonters. And whereas according to the Department of Health's 2018 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System Report, Non-white Vermonters are statistically less likely to have a personal doctor, statistically more likely to report poor mental health, more than twice as likely to report rarely or never getting the necessary emotional and social support, significantly more likely to have depression, significantly more likely to have been worried about having enough food in the past year, and significantly more likely to report no physical activity during leisure time, and Whereas non-white Vermonters are disproportionately represented in the total number of patients in the highest level of involuntary hospital beds in the state, comprising 15% of the patients admitted to the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital between May 1st of 2019 and April 30th of 2020. And whereas social determinants of health are underlying contributing factors of the foregoing health inequities. And whereas 21% of black Vermonters own their own homes, while 72% of white Vermonters own their own homes, and nationally 41% of black Americans own their own homes. And whereas the median household income of black Vermonters is 
$41,533, while the medium household income of white Vermonters is $58,244. And whereas in 2018, 23.8% of Black Vermonters were living in poverty, while 10.7% of white Vermonters lived in poverty, and 57% of Black Vermonters earned less than 80% of Vermont's medium income, while 43% of white Vermonters earn less than 80% of Vermont's medium income. And whereas about one in two non-white Vermonters experience housing problems, which is defined as having homes that lack complete kitchen facilities or plumbing, having overcrowded homes, or paying more than 30% of household income towards rent, mortgage payments, and utilities. And whereas Vermont Vermonters excuse me, Black Vermonters are overrepresented among Vermonters experiencing homelessness and that they make up 6% of Vermonters experiencing homelessness while making up approximately 1% of Vermont's population. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives that racism constitutes a public health emergency in Vermont, be it further resolved that this legislative body commits to the sustained and deep work of eradicating systemic racism throughout the state, actively fighting racist practices and participating in the creation of more just and equitable systems. And be it further resolved that this legislative body commits to coordinating work and participating in ongoing action grounded in the science and data to eliminate race-based health disparities and eradicate systemic racism, and be it further resolved that the Secretary of State be directed to send a copy of this resolution to the Governor, Chief Justice of the Vermont Supreme Court, League of Cities and Towns, all regional planning commissions, and the Vermont Racial, Racial Justice Alliance. So that's it. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. Uh, perhaps if you could just briefly explain how, if at all, um, a committee working on a resolution is the same or different from working on a bill? Sure. Um, so far, this process has been fairly similar to a bill request. I was assigned the resolution, much like I'm assigned um, a bill request. Um, and I worked with the sponsors to um, come up with the whereas clauses and to provide um, citation for each of the classes. So we have each of the statistics backed up with documentation. Um, and then from there, the process has been fairly similar to um, committee members having an opportunity to sign on to sponsor the resolution and have it introduced. Um, and as you know, it's been referred to your committee, much like a bill. And the committee um, at this point has um, responsibility over um, reviewing the bill and making it, um, any changes that it feels necessary before bringing this resolution back to the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think that's helpful to understand the process. Uh, before we go on to our first witness, um, Representative Wood. Um, this is a, a process question, Madam mm -hmm. Chair. Um, so um, I perhaps should know the answer to this, but I don't. So um, when does the speaker assign a resolution to a committee? Well, under what, I don't understand under what circumstances that a resolution is assigned to a committee versus, you know, just passed by the house or, you know, whatever. So you're you're making me want to check house rules to see if there's um, any language that that creates a distinction. In my experience, it's been that policy resolutions are more likely to be referred to a committee, whereas resolutions that are um, congratulating a sports team, for example, are are not likely to be referred to a committee and just go um, straight to the floor. But because this um, particular resolution has particular policy implications, um, I believe that's the distinction. Thank you. Uh, Representative Rosenquist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just if, if uh, a resolution like a bill is referred to committee, is it required by the committee to take up the resolution? Or it seems to me if a bill comes to the committee, many of them stay on the wall. So is what, what determines whether this gets taken up by our committee, given 
the many things we're dealing with during this period of time. Um, I was frozen. I'm not sure if that question was directed at, <laughs> I didn't hear the whole question, but I think the question was um, what determines whether this is taken up. And I would say it's the same as anything that's referred to the committee that things, um, bills, resolutions are added to the wall and that um, anything that comes off the wall is at the discretion of the chair. Thank you, Katie. The, um, the speaker has, uh, has identified that um, equity and uh, racial justice is an uh, important um, and integral part of our collective work this um, session. And um, so the expectation was before that we take it up. And I think, and I personally think that it is um, important. Um, we're going to uh, work on this as we work on three, if not four, other um, issues. Just as the the um, we were working on this along with the other bills in uh, that are in front of us. Representative Redmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to um, kind of offer uh, another. Um, comment and that is just that I, I'm actually really glad we're taking this up. Um, I feel like the time we're in is um, perfect. It, it's a perfect time to really look into these things and I know we have other priorities um, and we'll we'll get to as much as we can but I, I really am grateful that we are looking at this today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, other comments right now? Um, okay, our first, um, oh, uh, Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we're we're going to treat this just as we treat any other bill, correct? I mean, mm -hmm. we're going to listen to some uh, testimony and ask questions about it, et cetera, just yes. as, as any other bill. Exactly, exactly. We'll... Um, if there's wording that we disagree with, that we think should be different, if we have questions um, um, about the data or about what this means, yes, absolutely, um, talk, uh, Representative McBawn. Today is um, today is just um, the introduction. Um, uh, today we uh, we have. Um, Mark Hughes, <clears throat> who um, is from the Racial Justice Organization, um, who, and uh, if you noted, they will be getting a, um, a copy of this. Um, we have um, the uh, Commissioner of Health, the Vermont Commissioner of Health, and, and we have uh, a, nationally, um, a nationally renowned um, educator and trainer and uh, provider, uh, Dr. Um, Avila. Um, am I pretty, I'm sorry, I, I always, um, I know Mercedes, I'm not gonna use that name, but am I pronouncing your name uh, correctly? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, uh, but uh, who, I hope in your introduction that you will um, introduce more specifically how she has, um, how you have um, testified um, nationally, um, as well as taught courses and uh, trained uh, people across the country um, and done research um, on this. Uh, um, so this is, uh, day one is sort of the uh, introduction. Um, and as you all know me well, I like to have us start with sort of some education. So in some respects, that's what this is. Um, Dr. Um, Avila, please. So thank you so much, um, uh, committee chair um, and Pew for having me and all the members in the committee. For those of you who um, 
you haven't seen my other testimony in the House um, Healthcare Committee related to health disparities legislation. That was a two hours a testimony. I encourage everybody to watch. It's a two part. We had to take a break. And I encourage everybody to, to watch um, that uh, testimony as well because it connects to uh, this issue of racism as a public health emergency in Vermont. So, what I'm going to do um, in this short time I have with you is to share um, some definitions related to this work. I'm also going to share. Um, racial disparities at the intersection of health disparities at the national level and in Vermont, and then some of the work I've been involved in advocating uh, for, for example, removing eligibility criteria for BIPOC communities in Vermont. That was one of the, um, the professionals in Vermont who advocated for that eligibility to be removed that happened last week, and then some um, data related to vaccine uh, allocation, um, equity and some of the disparities that we are currently seeing related to COVID-19 um, vaccines here in Vermont. So as um, um, Representative Anne Pugh mentioned, I'm, um, I'm an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Vermont in the Learner College of Medicine. I'm also um, the director of a program called Vermont Land Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities. And most of my career for the last 20 years in Vermont and nationally, nationally has focused on addressing and eliminating health disparities and advancing uh, knowledge related to health equity and racial equity at the intersection of health equity. And I've done work in more than 27 states and I've trained more than 10,000 providers in this work of intersection of racial disparities with health disparities. Yet today, and this is a disclaimer, I'm speaking today as a health disparities and health equity scholar, but my views are not necessarily those of the University of Vermont. I'm also a member of the governor's uh, Phil Scott's governor a racial equity task force. I was appointed last summer specifically to look at health disparities in COVID-19. And that was an initiative that is happening across the nation with racial equity to address um, COVID-19 health disparities that are happening um, across the nation and also in Vermont. So let's look briefly at some definitions that I generally share related to this work. This is one of the most important definitions by the World Health Organization related to health disparities. Health disparities are unnecessary and they are avoidable and they are unfair and unjust. So if we say that health disparities are unnecessary and avoidable, what we are saying is that health disparities are preventable. There are things that we can do in our society, in our communities, in our country, to ensure that disparities don't exist to begin with. And once they take place, there are many best practice models and approaches to addressing and eliminating health disparities and inequities. One of them is declaring racism as a public health emergency, crisis or epidemic. There are different terminology that is happening across the nation. Other uh, best practice models is to have health disparities legislation that regulates the way we do this work and then having mandates related to training, professional development, workforce diversity and related topics to address and eliminate these disparities. Why are they considered unfair and unjust? Because they disproportionately affect groups that have been historically disadvantaged in our society to this date, and they continue to be um, disproportionately disadvantaged. This is the definition of health equity by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a very short, um, simple definition that everyone, every member of our community, regardless of their um, identification of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, religious beliefs, sexual orientation, gender identity, they should have a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. That's our goal in this work of addressing health disparities and understanding uh, racism as a public health issue, that our goal is for every member of our community to have a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This is also the definition, and I know you're going to have Health Commissioner Mark Levine joining later on uh, about this topic. This is um, the definition he gave in 2018 related to health equity. The, he defined it as health equity exists when all people have a fair and just opportunity to be healthy 
especially those who have experienced socioeconomic disadvantage, historical injustice, and other systemic inequalities that are associated with social categories of race, gender, ethnicity, social position, gen sexual orientation. So again, keeping in mind that we, our goal is to ensure that all community members in our communities, in our society, have a just and fair opportunity to be as healthy as possible. So what is happening with COVID-19 um, across the nation that has led to more than 190 declarations of racism as a public health emergency across the United States. For many of you, you might know that COVID-19 is called by many of us in this health equity field, the racism pandemic, because COVID-19 has resurfaced many racial inequities that had existed for a long time in the United States, and now they have become more salient as a result of a public health emergency and a pandemic like COVID-19 is happening across the globe and in the United States. These are some racial disparities, and this is a chart by the CDCs. Um, what you see on, these are hospitalizations of um, patients with COVID-19. On the top, you see race gender and then underlying conditions. And I'm gonna focus on underlying conditions and this definition, as you saw in the declaration, this is addressed in the declaration that was just read to the committee. Underlying condition is defined as having a diabetes, hypertension, asthma, cardiovascular disease. Interestingly, the definition of underlying conditions or chronic health problems for accessing vaccines has been defined differently across states in the United States, which speaks to how these are socially constructed definitions that vary, can be expanded, can be adapted based on issues that are happening in our society. What is important to understand, <clears throat> excuse me, about underlying conditions is that underlying conditions are also the direct result of exposure to poverty, redlining, gentrification, food deserts, healthcare disparities, and most importantly, environmental, structural, systemic, and institutionalized racism. So what I urge everybody who attends my presentations is to focus on critical thinking and emotional intelligence. We need to be addressing systemic, structural, and institutionalized issues in our country and in our communities as issues that we critically think about why are specific groups disproportionately affected by COVID-19? Why are specific communities um, exposed to higher chronic health problems compared to other communities? So what is happening at the environmental structural levels that are causing these disparities to take place? Instead of blaming victims for their position in society. I have heard so many times being a professor and teaching in this field, I have had so many students that have said, why don't African Americans try harder? Why don't Hispanic Latinos do this? Why don't Native American communities do that? And when, what happens when we make comments like that is that we apply our system of privilege and position in society into another person without critically thinking about what are the issues that are preventing communities from thriving and leading flourishing lives in our society. That's a responsibility we all have, whether it's legislators, whether it's providers, whether it's um, um, health equity scholars, anybody in this field to ensure that we critically think about these issues and we lead the work in a way that we are forming just humane providers in the future to be able to address disparities and inequities that take place on an ongoing basis. The American Public Health Association um, a few months ago released this statement that is on their website that says across the country, local and state leaders are declaring racism a public health crisis or emergency. And these declarations are an important first step to uh, advancing racial equity and justice and must be followed by allocation of resources and strategic action. And again, this is the one of the most important aspects of this work, and I highlight it here, that we need to have a declaration of racism as a public health crisis emergency, um, but we also need to have allocation of resources and a strategic action that go, go hand in hand with these types of declarations. Because sometimes we have declarations or legislation bills that are enacted, but there is no funding then 
to address the, the health disparities and inequities or effectively address the disparities and inequities in, in our communities. The American Public Health Association also created this website that has a map of declarations across the United States. So this is the map and there are, uh, as you can see on the top here, there are more than 190 declarations across the United States and this highlights the states that have declared racism as a public health crisis and then the cities and the counties and towns and county boards that are focusing on this work across the United States. And let's look at one example. This is one of my favorite examples from the declarations is the definition of racism as a public health crisis by one of the cities in Ohio from 2020. They define racism as a social system that has multiple dimensions, including individual racism that is internalized or interpersonal, covert racism, which is subtle and often socially acceptable. And this is something that I generally compared to uh, states like Vermont that happen to be liberal and progressive. Racism doesn't generally happen in an overt manner, but it happens more in a covert manner or more subtle manner compared to other states where it might be more overt. So that's something to also keep in mind. Overt racism, which is blatant and often unrepentant. Systemic racism, which is institutional or structural. And systemic racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on social interpretation of value, which unfairly disadvantages specific groups and unfairly gives advantages to other groups and communities. What most importantly, it saps the strengths of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And this is the biggest takeaway message of this definition that we waste human resources talent and opportunity when black and Latino children end up incarcerated instead of in post-secondary education, when uh, black and Latino men end up incarcerated, like we have currently higher rates of incarceration instead of being part of our workforce. This is a waste of talent, resources, and human resources that at the end affects every one of us and communities and society as a whole. For those of you who are following the city of Burlington, this is the declaration of a racism as a public health epidemic that happened uh, last year in the city of Burlington. And this is one of the quotes from um, that city. One of the reasons for this community declaration is that the coronavirus has laid bare a terrible and non-standing truth. The result of deeply embedded structural racism that black and brown Americans experience far worse um, health outcomes compared to their white neighbors. And let's look at how far worse those outcomes look like in Vermont, which is the second whitest state in the country. So keeping in mind that we live in the, in the second whitest state in the country, and we are seeing disparities similarly to other states across the nation. In Vermont, Black Vermonters are overrepresented among COVID-19 cases. They make up 1.4% of the state population and more than 14% of confirmed positive cases. And if somebody asked uh, earlier the citation, so this is this data from the Department of Health uh, from July 2020, and they have a uh, current data now that has come out related to these issues as well. One in five cases are people of color in Vermont. Black or African-American Vermonters have the highest rate. And I want also the group to keep in mind that Black and African-Americans are the smallest racially diverse group in our state. The largest uh, racially diverse group is Hispanic and Latinos, and then uh, two or more races. Um, so, so this is even more alarming that African-Americans and Black or African-Americans have the highest rates of COVID-19, followed by Asian and Hispanic Latino, again, in the second whitest state in the country. Let's look at children because I work in pediatrics and in child development and I'm always um, shocked by this statistic that came out last summer in our state. And this is the age breakdown of COVID-19 positive cases across age groups. And if you look at these cases, these are positive cases. And for children under 19 of positive cases in Vermont for children, 56% were children of color. And if you look at under nine, 68% were children of color. So this is one a sad example in a way of the impact of systemic racism, the impact of um, 
not having information, reaching communities in a timely manner. Uh, many limited English proficient communities didn't have accurate and timely information about COVID-19 until May or June of 2020. And that delay in a few months of getting information led to um, uh, several of the outbreaks that we had in the Winooski area. And as many of you know, Winooski is the, the most diverse city that we have right now. More than 25% of Winooski's population is racially diverse, which is showing also the demographic changes that are taking place in Chitten and across the state of Vermont. These are more statistics that came out um, in one of the statements that Governor, um, that Commissioner Mark Levin gave in um, the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems uh, in the 2020 conference. He explained that BIPOC are more likely to be part of an outbreak, more likely to have been in contact with someone else who had COVID, more likely to have household contact with a case, as we saw the largest outbreaks in Winooski. Important also to note that many BIPOC community members have um, a higher rate of living in multi-generational households. So when COVID-19 affected disproportionately these communities, it was very impractical to try to isolate or quarantine a family when you have a couple of family members that tested positive compared to some family members that tested negative in the same household. It was almost impossible to isolate on quarantine that led to more positive cases in, in those communities. Uh, Commissioner Levin also mentioned in this uh, keynote opening that he did for the, for the conference that I followed uh, the presentation that BIPOC Vermonters are also more likely to have underlying conditions that can make COVID more serious. And Commissioner Levin attributed these underlying conditions to the conditions and circumstances that people are living in. In other words, the social determinants of health, which these are defined as education, economic stability, health and healthcare, neighborhood and built environment, and social and community context. So keeping in mind um, in the declaration that was just presented to this committee that it was explained that uh, racism is a social determinant of health. We know that exposure to racism, discrimination, incarceration, fall under the social and community context of the social determinants of health. It's one of the five main areas affecting a person's life in the United States. And those five areas represent 65 to 70% of a person's life in our society. So I also included here, I mentioned this earlier, these were the two um, testimonies I gave about the health disparities legislation and the articles that led that discussion that I encourage everybody to, to watch and read. Then these are some of the articles I've done if, and interviews for the news related to racial disparities and the impact of COVID-19. There are many more that are coming up next week that are gonna be, there's gonna be an article uh, and, um, and an interview in the national news, specifically about removing eligibility criteria for BIPOC community members. So let's look briefly at vaccine access and outreach. We learned last fall that um, many community members from um, refugee and immigrant communities had concerns about the vaccine and questions. So we immediately put together a group of uh, three of us and we, organized 16 educational sessions that took place in the, at the end of the fall and spring of 2021. And we reached more than 500 community members to this date. And this is um, um, a statement from Governor Phil Scott about the racist responses that have taken place related to vaccination of BIPOC populations. And he explained that Vermont's data shows that BIPOC population is at increased rate of hospitalization for COVID-19. And these populations are already experiencing historical inequities and disparities. And when we look at vaccination rates right now, BIPOC community members are accessing vaccines at a rate of 20% compared to 33% to white, non-Hispanic whites. So most of the effort that we are leading with BIPOC vaccination clinics that are happening every Saturday, and I'm there every Saturday um, helping with those initiatives and the limited English proficient clinics that are happening twice a week in Burlington and Winooski that I was there also for, for a couple of months before we started the BIPOC clinics are efforts that are data driven and they're specifically created to ensure that we provide a culturally and linguistically responsive space 
for community members to access vaccines in an informed manner with um, a culturally and linguistically responsive approach. So we conducted five sessions in the fall um, related to COVID vaccines concerns led by Dr. Kristen Pierce, who is an infectious disease doctor from UVMMC, and we reached 200 community members. And then we did 11 sessions this spring. We had two more coming up next week and one this evening in more than 18 languages. The Spanish version is available online. So if you are interested in watching the sessions that we do and the concerns, the questions that come up from the community members about vaccines, I encourage also everybody to watch uh, that video. So the advocacy that we've done has led to having LEP vaccination clinics and BIPOC community clinics. This is the video for the vaccine education session in Spanish that we recently uh, did in our community. So we know that the clinics that we are doing right now in the communities are not only addressing systemic racism as a public health problem, but are able to reach to our community members in a way that is much more effective, less intimidating, and in a culturally and linguistically effective way. The last point I have here in the slide is to encourage all leaders to continue to advocate for systemic change and speaking up against systemic racism. We know that uh, there has been a lot of racist comments about vaccine vaccination clinics in the last uh, few days and last week. So we encourage everybody to, to speak up um, against systemic racism and declaring systemic racism as a public health crisis is one of the most effective ways to do this work. So I'm gonna leave you with this quote, which is actually from our governor, Phil Scott, in response to these racist comments. And he explained that unfortunately, the legacy of racism in America and in Vermont still drives a lot of anger and fear. It is evidence that many Americans and many Vermonters still have a lot to learn about the impacts of racism in our country and how it has influenced public policy over the years. And I could not agree more with Governor Phil Scott and this declaration of racism as a public health crisis is um, um, a perfect example of the response that we have to give to show that we understand the impact of systemic racism in public health and that all communities are valued, respected and included in our, in our communities and in everything that we do. So thank you again. I'm gonna stop sharing and um, answer any questions that you might have related to this topic. And thank you again for having me. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Um, Avila. It's really um, very um, helpful and informative. And I'm sure we have some questions though. Um, Representative Redmond. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Avila. Really appreciate um, all of this great information. Um, I, um, in going to get my shot the other day, I noticed um, a lot of um, families of color coming in and getting their shots, which was wonderful to see. And I'm curious if you have any information or data on um, what the response has been um, with the, the latest order that um, people of color may bring family members when they come and get their vaccines. Are people taking advantage of that in, um, from your understanding? Thank you for that question. And there are, there are currently two initiatives um, going on at the same time. One is the limited English proficient clinic. Some people call them ELL or LEP clinics that are happening twice a week in Burlington and Winooski. And those are reaching currently 300 community members every week. And then we have the BIPOC clinics on Saturdays, which are reaching 264 community members. And this Saturday we start first and second dose. So it's gonna be 468 community members every Saturday for the next few weeks. So those initiatives currently have a couple of weeks um, um, of wait lists of, of community members eager to, to be able to access vaccine, which speaks to how outreach, education, and addressing concerns increases that likelihood of uh, being interested in accessing a vaccine. After we did the first vaccine education session, we saw a dramatic increase in interest in accessing vaccines. And once the eligibility was completely removed last week, we saw an increase also in registrations going on in LEP clinics, in BIPOC clinics, and in the general public clinic, which speaks to the interest uh, that communities have in accessing vaccines. Unfortunately, we are still seeing that 
BIPOC communities are behind in rates of vaccination, especially the lowest right now is for native indigenous community members, which is understandable due to the history of eugenics, the medical experimentation that happened in Vermont and across the country. So now we are being strategic in figuring out how to reach out to um, um, native and indigenous communities in an effective manner that can help build and in many times rebuild that trust. So again, I think the efforts are um, showing that are effective and successful, but we still have a lot of work to do to increase the rates of vaccination for BIPOC communities in specific communities. Thank you for that question. Um, thank you. We have um, a, a one from Representative Wood and then Representative Brumstead. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I uh, have a question regarding one of the charts that you showed, which um, surprised me a little bit when you were, uh, it was showing the, the, um, the, the rate, especially around children, when you were highlighting the rate around children. What I was also surprised to see in that chart is on the other end of the scale on older um, Vermonters, BIPOC Vermonters, it seemed L uh, much less so, and I'm just, uh, that surprised me. Um, and I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that since, you know, we knew early on that that was a more vulnerable part of the population, people who are older. I was e expecting to see um, similar rates of uh, BIPOC infections there as, as we saw in the younger ones, but it seemed much dramatically less. And that's a, thank you for that question. That's a, um, an important question because I think it's driven by the demographics of our communities. Um, much of the racial diversity of our state, more than 50% of the racial diversity of Vermont state is driven by refugee resettlement and immigrant migration. And we know that the majority of that population is within the 30 to 50 year old um, age group. When you go older, um, the numbers are pretty small. So when we started, for example, the LEP clinics, we started with 50 uh, vaccines in every clinic, 100 vaccines, and that was enough to reach many of the communities that we needed to reach. Once we started reaching the 50 year old, 40 year old, we, there were thousands of community members. So I think it has to do with the numbers in elderly populations that um, is directly impacted by how many cases we're going to see because the populations are much smaller in that age group. Wow, ah, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Representative Brumstead and then Representative Small. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much, um, Dr. Avila. I, um, I was curious just your, everything that you said was interesting and helpful and something to really sit and think about a bit as we take on this resolution and do it as well as we can and, and realize the incredible importance of doing it. Um, I, I just wondered as our first person to come and talk with us, whether or not you have any suggestions for us with regard specifically to the resolution, does it, you know, I'll just leave it at that. What, what are your thoughts specifically? Is it, does it meet the, the need, the wording and so forth? How, how does it look to you? So your, your question is specifically about the, the resolution itself or whether the resolution um, should be passed or is effective in, a, in addressing? Yeah, no, just more specifically, the first um, is whether or not when you look at this resolution, does it um, is there anything missing? Is there any, what would be your thoughts as we move forward on this work? So that, that's a, um, another great question. I, I always say this is similar to when I gave testimony to the health disparities legislation. Somebody asked me a similar question and I said, if I had written the health disparities legislation, it would have been probably 40 pages long. However, uh, because there's so much we need to do to address health disparities. Similarly to this resolution, if you look at the, there are 190 examples across the nation and there are, some of them are very similar. Some of them are very different, but many of them are short and very concise. Um, I think this is a great example of the different disparities that exist by income, 
housing. Um, I would even add when I do presentations that are disparities in education, suspension rates of children of color, incarceration of communities of color. Those are all aspects of systemic racism as well. You have homelessness explained there. Um, the BIPOC uh, COVID-19 health disparities are all explained there. I think the, the resolution is clear, at least for those of us who who work in the racial equity field, um, it's clear what the disparities are. You can continue to add this, um, many disparities and inequities that exist in many intersecting social determinants of health, but I don't know how much that will add or take away from already a resolution that has uh, had so much work taken into putting it together. And this is something I always share um, as well related to the health disparities legislation that um, legislation related to health disparities started at the federal level in 2014. We are in 2021 for the first time in our history in Vermont, talking about something that started seven years ago at the federal level, and it was led by a BIPOC organization in the state of Vermont. So also being respectful that it, it took uh, communities of color to advocate for this change to take place. And when they asked me if I if I would modify it, of course, I would add probably 25 pages of literature around health disparity that we have had for decades in the United States. However, the legislation is, is effective, is clear, similar to the racism as a health um, as a, health, a public health crisis, the information is clear, concise, and to the point. We could expand and add many more other areas, but if that will delay the process of declaring racism as a public health crisis, I would advocate for moving forward and then eventually continue to add. There is an urgency to declare racism as a public health crisis. We see it across the nation. That's why so many states and cities declared it last year in 2020. So that would be my, my, my response is that there is a sense of urgency and there is a lot of work that was put together in this declaration. It can always be better, it can always be longer because I work in this field. We can always find more data, but at the end of the day, the importance is to ensure that we are actively uh, dismantling systemic racism so all communities can thrive. But thank you for that question. Thank you very much. Um, Representative Small, and then does Representative Wood, do you have another comment? Representative Small, then Representative um, Whitman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Avila, for your presentation today. I think uh, what is resounding for me is that the action on this resolution is a response to a, a long, long history uh, of racism within our institutions and and our organizations. And uh, my first question is really in regards to education as the protective factor and wanting to know what does the education look like currently around health disparities, specifically when we look at people of color uh, for physicians or even medical students? I mean, beyond your uh, very in-depth presentations, which I think is, is tackling a piece of this issue. And thank you so much for that question because that's my my field and uh, what I love talking about, I'm an educator. So I strongly believe that education is key in addressing many of the systemic issues that we have in our society, but not just education, but ongoing education and training around this topic, around health disparities, health inequities, and racial disparities at the intersection of health disparities. I, I mentioned every time I do presentations that I was not born in the United States, so I was born in another country. However, I, spent, I have spent my career teaching US born people about the history of the United States, which speaks to the gaps in knowledge that exist related to systemic racism in the US and how this country was founded, how um, racial disparities, the root causes of racial disparities and how those connect to health disparities. My research of having trained more than 10,000 providers across 27 states shows that providers don't know the history of racial disparities and systemic racism, which directly links to not understanding health disparities in today's 2021 US. And, and this is one of the key aspects of the work that we need to do. 
I, I strongly believe that education and training should be mandatory for providers. We, there are examples happening across the nation. California passed legislation mandating bias training for all healthcare providers to be able to practice in the state of California. I think it's a change that we're gonna to continue to see. There, is, there are bills in the Senate right now at the national level looking at mandatory training, anti-racism and bias training for all healthcare providers. We know that there is a direct correlation between provider bias poor provider patient communication and health literacy issues with poor health outcomes in our community. So the more education we provide around uh, health disparities, health inequities, the history of racial uh, discrimination and racism in the United States, the more we're gonna be able to narrow these health disparities and eventually eliminate them if we are able to uh, effectively dismantle systemic racism. But I think it's a great question. I've been an advocate for 20 years in Vermont uh, to mandate this type of training and education for all providers, all health, and, and not just health providers, but health and allied health providers. Any provider that works with patients should be receiving ongoing education and training around these topics because we know that the harm that is caused in communities and the distrust that happens when there is a poor interaction leads to poor health outcomes and distrust in the system. And then we see what we're seeing now with vaccines that communities don't want to access uh, a vaccine that is one of the, the only thing that we have right now to stop uh, this pandemic from, from growing. So that's a, a great question. I've been a strong advocate of mandating ongoing education and training for all providers and start as early as possible in preschool if possible no to teach about the social construction of race systemic racism somebody asked me in the news the other day uh, when i thought it was the the time for children to learn about anti-racism and my response to that is if children of color can experience racism since they are born every child can learn anti-racism from the moment they're born. So that's my response. And having a six-year-old is my, my approach to ensure that children understand and can learn about social construction of race, systemic racism, and they can become you know, active members and change agents in, in addressing these systemic issues. But thank you so much. I can talk about this all day, but I will leave it there and, and, and go to the next question. Thank you. I also... Um... Thank you for that. I also think about a presentation that we uh, had as a legislative body early on this year um, from Susanna Davis, the Director of Racial Equity. Um, and there's one slide that's coming up in, uh, up for me in regards to a, a medical textbook that talks about pain and pain scales for various ethnicities and races. Um, would you be able to touch on that, especially since our committee just worked so hard on an opioid uh, bill in preventing slash saving lives. Thank you for that question. And that's also directly connected to the work that we need to do in um, health and allied health education, especially in higher education. My um, The courses I used to teach um, were called racism and health disparities. And I would start my courses um, at the university saying race is a social construct invented, created to justify inequalities in the United States. It's not based on genetics, it's not based on biology, but it was socially created to justify inequalities. And I will have students that will come with a book, uh, several books, not one book, and they will show me, but Dr. Avila, this is what we've been learning in our school that says race is genetic in origin, is it defines hair type, nose shape, eye shape. And when I look at the book, it had been revised in 2013, 15. So it wasn't that long ago. And um, I brought this up um, in academia. So this is an ongoing issue that the way we continue to teach about health disparities uh, can lead students to believe that uh, there is nothing we can do, which is so dangerous. No, there is nothing we can do if we say that uh, these issues are based on biology or genes, which is not correct. These issues are based on social, environmental, and structural conditions, which are created by our policies, especially public policies. So we need to see, critically think about these issues. And this is why when I open the presentation, I talk about critical thinking and emotional intelligence. We focus on intellectual teaching most often, but we don't actually focus on forming just humane providers. And that has been one of the root causes of many of the health disparities that we have. When we have providers that say, for example, I treat all patients equally, and I respond to them and I say, we need to be treating patients 
equitably, which is a very different concept. In, it has to be fair, it has to be just, it has to meet the specific needs of the communities. Giving everybody the same doesn't work because we do not live in a level playing field. So aspects of the work that we need to be doing and how we need to rethink a professional development, training for health and allied health providers, and all this can be regulated through, through legislation. Again, I'm a strong advocate of mandating changes that should happen. We are in 2021, so I think it's time, with everything happening in our country, it's time to critically think about the work that we do and how we can change this work. And thank you for that. Those are two of my favorite questions, so thank you so much for those questions. Well, I'm glad I, I hit the top two, and I just have a, a one more, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, uh. Yeah, the last question is really, uh, as we're talking about COVID and talking about vaccines, um, and understanding and hearing hesitancy from Black Americans around taking a vaccine, where there's uh, plenty of research out about its efficacy and supports in promoting herd immunity, and wondering from that historical perspective why there would be that hesitancy in, in receiving a vaccine from our medical systems. Thank you, and that is my third favorite question. So uh, the, the reason we're seeing hesitancy in, in access to vaccines is there are two issues. One, there is um, a global aspect of unethical medical experimentation that happened in Africa, in South America, across the nation. So for some of us come from countries where when you hear a brand or, a, or the name of a pharmaceutical, we immediately associate that with something that happened badly back home or, or there was a negative impact in a specific community. So that is, we're never gonna forget that aspect. The other issue is that if somebody has a negative experience with the medical system or the healthcare system in the US, it's gonna create distrust to be able to access a vaccine in a time of a pandemic. There's, we have had questions in the vaccine education sessions, especially from um, um, African communities. They wanted to know if the vaccine vial will be mixed right in front of them. And that speaks to that distrust that exists that if somebody brings um, a, a syringe from a few feet away and you don't know where that's coming from, there is that type of distrust. So we had questions in the educational sessions specifically asking who is bringing the vaccines, how are they being mixed, are white people receiving the same vaccine that we are? Why? Um, so all these questions speak to the distrust. I mentioned earlier the eugenics movement um, and other um, horrific events that connected to medical and ethical research in BIPOC communities that continue, has passed through generation and continues to negatively affect our communities and build that distrust um, with the healthcare system and the medical system. I, I'm at every, I've been in at every BIPOC clinic for the last three Saturdays. I always say there's no happier place right now in medicine than to be in a COVID vaccine clinic. And uh, we've heard from community members that are coming to the clinic that they would not have gone to a larger clinic. They would have not gone to a clinic run by a health center or a state health department that they came to these BIPOC clinics because they see trusted, trusted leaders. They see trusted BIPOC organizations on site and they see some of us getting the vaccine. So many people ask me, did your mom get the vaccine? Did you get the vaccine? So we take pictures, we put them on social media. So many people ask me, if you get the vaccine, I will get the vaccine, which speaks to that trust that some people have with uh, community members in being able to rebuild that trust. We still have a lot of work to do. We still see concerns and hesitancy um, in some communities to access uh, vaccines. We now have a new vaccine coming into the market like Johnson & Johnson, and so many people are saying, um, you know, we don't want that specific vaccine. So now we started educational sessions to talk about the efficacy of the J&J &J vaccine. And that speaks to the issue that the vaccine hasn't been in the, in the population long enough to be able to build that trust with a specific brand a specific vaccine. So we have to, it takes time to build trust with in the medical field and in medical practice. So everything takes time and rushing it sometimes can be more problematic than um, effective. And thank you again for all those questions. Of course, thank you, Dr. Avila. Thank you for having me. We have um, one last question um, that we're able to, or one last person is able to ask questions. Um, Representative Whitman. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you so much, Dr. Avila, for being here today. Uh, for your testimony and all of your work in the field. Um, really appreciate it. Um, mine's a little bit more of a, looking at the resolution question. There is one paragraph that uh, raised questions for me. And with you here, I figured I you are a perfect person to ask being a doctor and, and so much experience in this field. Um, it's the last paragraph um, of page one. Um, and you mentioned underlying conditions uh, in your presentation. The language here, I'll just read it aloud, is um, whereas while there are not statistically significant differences in the rates of pre-existing conditions such as diabetes, lung disease, and cardiovascular disease among white and non-white Vermonters, there are disparities in the rates of pre-existing conditions among Vermonters testing positive for COVID-19 which suggests that non-white Vermonters are at a higher risk of exposure to COVID-19 due to their type of employment and living arrangements. So what I kind of hear from this is that um, it's like a line of reasoning saying that while we can't necessarily uh, say that there's a statistically significant difference in pre-existing conditions, we do see that there are more pre-existing conditions among uh, people that uh, have uh, been infected with COVID-19, and that's disproportionately more so uh, people of color. Are you reading that the same way? And do you think that that's, um, would you agree with that statement? Correct. And I think what the statement is also leading to is to the other social determinants of health, like employment, housing, uh, and living conditions are directly leading to many of the disparities that we're seeing with COVID-19. We know that many a BIPOC community members are working in, in jobs that are defined during the pandemic as essential jobs. So they're more at risk to be able to test positive for COVID-19. And many of them also, as I mentioned earlier, they live in multi-generational households, also exposing the family members in a, at higher rates of COVID-19. When we started the LEP clinics, in Winooski and Burlington, the goal was to vaccinate not only eligible uh, BIPOC community members, but all household members. And the strategy and the advocacy, I was one of the community members who advocated for that. The rationale behind that was not only the high rates of COVID in children, that the way to protect children was to vaccinate everybody in the household, but also because we were seeing that due to the employment exposure that some community members had, they were uh, in making other household members positive as well and testing positive. So the, the more we were able to vaccinate all household members, regardless of age, anybody who was older than 16, uh, we were able to protect everybody in the household. So I think it's looking at um, exposure to COVID-19, but also all other social determinants of health, like housing conditions, employment conditions, education. So all other social determinants of health are also leading to um, higher COVID cases and hospitalizations in BIPOC communities. Thank you so much for that question. And I know I'm way over time, but that's what generally happens when we talk about health disparities. Thank you, I appreciate and, it. Um, thank you, doctor. And um, you're not over time. I actually figured um, that this would happen. You have a lot of information to share. You're a fabulous presenter. Um, and we like to ask questions. And so uh, the next person was scheduled for 10 o'clock and he actually has come. Um, so we are just on time. Thank you very, very much. Um, and it's good to see you here. Thank you Appreciate so much it. for having me. Um, okay, we have uh, Mark Hughes, who um, from the racial, um, Vermont Racial Justice um, Center. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm well. Thank, you, thank for you for having me, Madam Chair. Um, mm -hmm. for, for record, I am Mark Hughes, the Executive Director of Racial Justice Alliance, and I'm also the, the Director of uh, Justice for All. Uh, I am the um, sole proprietor of an LLC called the Racial Equity Association, which is also a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting firm I'm a retired army officer. I've resided in the um, Burlington area for the last two years and then in Washington County for about 10 years uh, prior to that. So I've been in the state for since 2009. Um, I came here, accepted a position at the um, 
folks over at the um, insurance company. What's the big insurance company down there? I forgot the name of it. It's um, I started in in um, you know what is now being called diversity, but we call racial justice. Uh, it it started in two thousand nine, and it was a result of not George Floyd, but Michael Brown. Uh, and I walked away from the uh, cybersecurity asbestos space uh, since then. So we started to come uh, a um, nonprofit as the um, RDAP, or we call it the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisor. Um, the coalition evolved to the Racial Justice Alliance, and there is a nonprofit called the Foundation that is the C3 um, and is doing business as the Racial Justice Alliance today. Um, the Racial Justice Alliance here in, in this session, um, in, in, uh, well, I should say last biennium, is you should note that the, um, we identified as the, the cornerstone of sustainable was the um, amending the constitution uh, to make it clear uh, that um, slavery and indentured servitude uh, across uh, from the Senate on Friday. Uh, that is, this is, uh, let's call it the third quarter, uh, because uh, it's already been through the House and the Senate once. Um, it will arrive in the House next week. Knowledge create and transform, and that is the way we framed our legislative agenda uh, in this session. And there are a, um, a litany of policies that are within that framework. Um, PR2 is, uh, is one of those. The, uh, declar the declaration, the declaration, uh, or I should say the uh, reparations, uh, a tech reparations task force bill, uh, a, a bill, a, a problem. ten because you all voted on it uh, last week or the week before, which is the, uh, also uh, you'll see um, policy on economic, uh, clearing obstacles for economic opportunity, uh, also housing and land access and ownership, um, cannabis market um, equity. Um, um, that was abolished slavery, Vermont, which is really speaks to the other activities that are happening, including cultural empowerment, where we do, we're doing affinity groups, where we are uh, teaching our people, uh, black and brown folks about their history, their culture, their power, their resilience, um, and also teaching a true history about uh, the nation, uh, the United States of America, 1865, and specifically the 1619 story. So the list goes on uh, with the um, other activities that we're doing in the communities. And I thought it was really important for, you, for me to frame the work of the resolution, the joint resolution. It was quite deliberate. Um, that we came forward with this. At the same time, we're doing the work here. Uh, our um, initiatives and our platforms and initiatives, uh, the work that we're doing um, are in full swing in the city of Burlington and in fact, uh, across Chittenden County. Um, you know, uh, some of the work that we've done in Chittenden County and specifically in the city of Burlington has led to uh, the creation of the Racial Equity, Inclusion and Belonging Office here in the city, as well as a standing committee of racial equity, inclusion and belonging, and various reforms in, in policing uh, here in the city of Burlington. Um, there is a standing, uh, a, um, standing task force um, that has been assigned the responsibility of uh, reparations, uh, uh, the only in the nation. There's not another one like this one in the nation. It's a result of the work that we've implemented here in Burlington. Uh, there is, um, there's in full swing an initiative called um, Operation Phoenix uh, Rise, um, where we're um, taking a look across public safety, uh, also um, cultural empowerment, economic, develop, uh, economic uh, development and equal opportunity and racial equity, inclusion and belonging across all uh, this, the city government uh, here. And we're in partnership with the city uh, in all of this work. And um, in addition to that, there is a standing, uh, a standing um, declaration here um, that not just from the city council, but from the mayor, where the Racial Justice Alliance has partnered with the city here uh, in their, um, their, public health, their public health emergency uh, resolution, which, which uh, 
I'm holding them in my hand. So we've partnered with the city in this work here. And to be clear, the reason why uh, this work is being done is um, in a, as a part of the combined efforts in addressing systemic racism. So I'll pause there for a minute. And what I'd like to do is, is get into um, telling you a little bit about um, you know, more of the work of the Alliance in, as well as how we've been um, facilitating and working in conjunction with some of these folks in Chittenden County. I wanna tell you who some of these folks are and what some of these folks are saying uh, surrounding um, the work that they've committed to organizationally. Um, I wanna take some questions on the, uh, the actual resolution itself. Um, as I, I did listen to part of the last segment and I, I heard that there were some thoughts and questions and any, we, you know, we authored this, this resolution, we wrote it. Uh, we, um, you know, clearly fully support it. You know, we were pre prepared to bring uh, some of our, um, some of our, some of our other folks, uh, you know, who are actually on the uh, wellness working group of the Alliance, uh, as well as on the steering committee of the Alliance. Um, Mayumi Cornell will submit a um, written testimony. Also the, the chair uh, of the foundation and also the, who's also the, the uh, pastor of New Alpha Missionary Baptist Church, the only black church here in Vermont, was prepared to bring testimony. Uh, he will offer written testimony and, 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 also, and also offer perspectives of some of many of our, our, um, our congregants as well. Um, again, I think, um, and if I could be allowed to also maybe share a couple slides, I could, I can, I, there are, are a couple things I wanted to drive home in terms of how we're framing um, this, um, this declaration on um, declaring uh, racism a, a public health emergency. Thank you. And, and uh, so, yeah, I just want to pause there for a minute, uh, Madam Chair, and see if, if there are um, or any questions thus far. And that way I can kind of head some off and maybe um, we could um, go to the next portion. Any questions, Madam Chair? Um, thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Hughes. And I, right now, I am not seeing um, any questions from the committee. They're particularly interested in hearing um, from you as you were the person identified um, as uh, being instrumental in the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance and being instrumental in writing the resolution. This is our first day of taking testimony and um, as is our um, usual and customary process, we then hear from people who were not necessarily involved, but um, in the writing or the crafting of the legislation, but who in fact would have interest in it um, because of who they are or um, who they represent. So we'll be trying to get testimony from um, a diverse group of stakeholders. Um, uh, and we are, um, treating this resolution as a bill. So um, uh, as, as you came in, um, you said you heard um, some of it is then looking at the language. You know probably better than, than, than I do that words matter and the importance of how we say things matter as well as the accuracy um, or whether we've, um, uh, there are things that, um, Upon a second reading, you would go, oh, yes, that makes sense. Um, you know, um, we would continue to support this if you added that. So um, do you please go um, forward? Sure, absolutely. Um, um, if you have slides, I, um, <clears throat> Julie, could you make uh, him? I have it. <laughs> oh, you already are. Absolutely. I do. So I, I um, would, would just say that, you know, at, at this stage in the game, uh, what I have in front of me is a, um, a small segment for, uh, in terms of impetus. I think a lot of folks are sitting there wondering, saying, why are we doing this? You know, what, is this, what does this really mean? And when I first heard the term, when I first heard uh, people talking about public health emergency, the first thing I thought about was, is, well, health. I, I thought about, you know, 
this this is this is about health and it's an emergency and and I was trying to put this racism and emergency thing together um honestly I, you know even with the work that we're doing I was actually thinking about it going how does that line up how does that come together and and what is that you know how you know what is the connection worth and um the first thing I went to is is yeah of course they're killing us you know and then I said well that's probably not going to you know that's probably not exactly what what we're we're really talking about and I began to start thinking about this whole, you know, how, you know, the things that we, how covert and overt and, and, and how systemic racism and, and institutional racism on aggregate, how it affects people how, and how it affects the, um, just not just demographics, but all of us. So there's a, there's a whole lot that goes into it, but I have something here that I re read to you just for a minute. This is, um, and this is the impetus for community declaration. And this is just from the work that's happening in Burlington. And I know sometimes talking about Burlington and Montpelier is like suicide, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Okay, so it's, it says um, the community declaration of racism as a public health emergency comes at a pivotal moment. First, the globe is uh, contending with the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Second, uh, across the nation and across Vermont, Black, Indigenous, and other uh, people of color have raised their voices to speak out against systemic racism and police violence in response to the death of George Floyd. And then it goes on to say, um, on June 29th, the city of Burlington, in partnership with the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, joined a small group and growing number of municipalities that declared racism a public health emergency in response to the enormous health disparities between blacks and whites in many areas, including COVID-19, infection and mortality rates, infant mortality, morbidity, and more mortality rates of, of many chronic diseases and police involved killings. So that was, that's what came out of Burlington um, last year. And I'm just, what I wanna do is I'm, I just wanna share a couple of comments because probably maybe three, three uh, dozen or so uh, organizations signed on to this. And uh, here's, here's um, uh, King Street Center, um, Vicki at King Street Center. She said, we've been examining our own practices, programs, environment, and integrating this learning into our ongoing st strategic plan. While we are not experts and recognize that this is an ongoing listening and learning process, we commit to being loud and proud members of an anti-racist community in which hatred and intolerance have no place. Here's, um, here's one over at Champlain College, and I'm just randomly, so I haven't pre-selected any of these, I'm just randomly reading uh, one, and this is, this is uh, uh, Benjamin um, Ola Akande, and I'm sorry about that, Benjamin. Um, ben Benjamin is the new uh, CEO there. Um, it says, we're proud to support the, uh, the city's efforts to create a whole systems approach to addressing the crisis of systemic racism that is threatening the lives and well-being and members of the community in our nation. Champlain College is committed to working in partnership with the city and those advocating for racial justice to advance this work in our community and contribute our, in our institutional strengths and expertise to create a stronger, more inclusive Burlington for all who live, work, and study here. Uh, here's Charlie Baker um, from Regional County Planning Commission. He said, um, we believe deeply that resources and opportunities, employment, afford affordable and plentiful housing, accessible transportation, quality education, healthcare, environmental justice, and overall quality of life must be allocated fairly so that all people can thrive. We must actively eliminate barriers to full meaningful participation in community life and work tirelessly to correct past injustices. We're committed to working through these issues together with our members, municipalities, partners, organizations, employers, and so forth. And finally, the last one I'll give you is Jeffrey McKee over at the Community Health Centers of Burlington. Um, and Jeffrey said, um, identifying and reducing health disparities has always been central to CHCB's mission of care. As such, we are uniquely prepared to act as a part of a local population health alliance in addressing racism as a public health issue. We are eager and ready to work together with our organizational partners and to build future, to build future 
um, built on anti-racism and equity for all members of the community. So I just wanted to share with you what some of the many, 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 many folks. And what happened here is, is that um, um, each one of these organizations provided a list of a number of initiatives that they wanted to um, sign off on. Uh, like for example, Burton said that they hired somebody as a full-time consultant for their Jedi committee. I know it sounds really, you know, tactical Jedi. I um, think that's justice, equity, diversity, and uh, inclusion. Um, there's a lot of those going on. A lot of those have started. Now, what I'm trying to get you a sense of is, is you know, the you know, kind of what what this actually began to put in motion here in our county, and just as a result of folks coming together and acknowledging something and building a community around it, how it has ignited uh, so much work that's happening uh, here in the prospect of that occurring across the state. Uh, Burton donated $1,000 to the, uh, $100,000 to the NAACP LDF. They joined in a solidarity project, project as a partner to play a role in bringing the outdoor industry together for a more inclusive um, and, uh, future and more. Um, Boys and Girls Club has a list of things, developing relationships with Vermont employers to create uh, and support professional opportunities for our BIPOC club members. This list goes on and on and on. There's 30 some organizations on this list, community health centers, Chittenden County State's attorneys, Champlain College, Champlain Housing Trust, Local Motion, Let's Grow Kids, Housing Vermont, um, the Family Room here, King Street Center, Lake Champlain Ch uh, Chamber, and the list goes on and on and on of um, just initiatives that are currently in play right now that are actionable, that are, that are producing outcomes that would not have existed had we not initiated this work here in, in the county. So um, I guess in, I got a couple slides um, and I just want, because where we started this work within the working group is really important to understand because what we began to understand more and more about the challenges that we're struggling with here is, is that as, as the doctor said prior to me, the, there are social determinants that are bearing down on black and brown folks uh, coming from every area. So I just wanted to talk a little bit more about that. And it's the impact that it's creating, you know, it, it is taxing and it is, um, it's, it's not good for your health. Uh, and it, and it's, it's not good for any of our health. So let me just show you something real quick here. And I think, um, I'm not quite sure. I don't know if my um, if my um, full presentation was was um, actually is actually working right. But I'm going to try it. And if if you could talk to me, Madam Chair, and let me know whether you're getting a full presentation uh, um, screen. Um, well, and I'm going to try it right now. Okay. Um, if you. Uh... Right now, we see um, some of, if you can go up and do, uh, I'm looking at your, um, is there a presentation it... mode? If you can do a presentation mode, because we see both the outline as well as your slide. Here's what um, I'm going to do is we're going to, Madam Chair, we're just going to go with this because I, I had the same issue last night and we never resolved it because I, even when I went to presentation mode, we were getting the same thing. So I'm just going to stay here. Okay. Um, I think, well, maybe I, I, I'll just have to do this because it, for effect, uh, what I wanted to do is I just wanted to show you the, um, just get a sense of how we're, you know, feeling the impact. So the, how, how we define, because there are many ways to kind of dissect this, but when you start to think about the determinants as, as far as um, how we are being impacted, it, it is our mm -hmm. culture, it is sure. our access to health services or the lack thereof, the you know access to income or wealth. We know that the median wealth of Black folks in America is one thirteenth that of the median wealth of white folks and growing, and we expect it to to um, to you know, to be exacerbated even more. We know the disparities in education in terms of, um, you know, the, um, the outcomes in, in our education system, expulsions, um, 
uh, suspensions, access to uh, higher education and so forth, housing and land access, the numbers are dismal here, even child development, safety and security, you know, and, and we want to kind of fold that into the whole uh, criminal justice system. And we understand that those disparities are being created uh, by, by systemic racism. I use this, this quote from a, um, and there are many, but Joe Fagan and Kimberly Ducey in the book, uh, Racist America, define systemic racism um, as uh, including the complex array of anti-Black practices, the unjustly gained political economic power of whites, the continuing economic and other resource inequalities along racial lines, and the white racist ideologies and attitudes created to maintain and rationalize white privilege and power. So here systemic racism means essentially if it exists anywhere, it exists everywhere. And that is what we have right now. And that and what is laying this all bare um, is, is obviously, you know, COVID-19. Um, what's happening now is, is that all of this is being exacerbated. So and this is really a slide that speaks more to why now. Um, or what now more effectively. And so I just wanted, that's, I think that was the main slide I wanted to share with you. Um, but I, I did wanna talk just a little bit about uh, something that is you know, related to some of the activities that we are doing as an organization and how it feeds into some of the things that we're talking about. Uh, when there is a group that meets here on a regular basis uh, the, the health outcomes group, and there are there are dozens of folks who who have aligned around this, and this group is going to be expanding, and it is as a direct result. Uh, you will hear for, from Dr. Levine later in, um, this morning, probably in about 30 minutes or so. He's one of those members. Uh, Steve Leffler is one of those members. Jeff Bridges is one of those members from United Way. I talked about Charlie Baker. Uh, there are many. James Helmstead. James Helmstead. Or um, the list goes on and on and on. And what we are what we're meeting on is, is having conversations around racism being a public health emergency in those actionable things that are, that we're trying to al align to be able to make progress, mainly surrounding the collection of racially disaggregated data and being able to move forward in a way where we are looking at various systems. Because here, here there are three things that need to happen that we need to do here if we're really talking about addressing racism uh, as being uh, the cause for this public health emergency. One is, is our personal work, obviously, and all of us are doing that. Then is, there's the organizational work. And then how do we work collectively um, to, to work on some of these systems? And, and what we mean by working collectively to work on some of these systems is, you'll hear a lot about data, 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 because data is going to be central to uh, eradicating systemic racism because we'll wanna be able to measure our progress. We'll wanna be able to look back and see where we're going, we don't want to be talking about collecting data 10 years from now. Um, and we don't want to be having a, a, an antidotal conversation about what we know to be empirical data existing. So, so that's why the data thing is, is there. So I'll just um, kind of go through some of this. I think one of the things that we're doing as a, as a working group in inside of the Alliance, now this is a, an Alliance conversation, is, is yes, we are informing that process and we're collaborating with partner organizations, but we're also working on our own disruptive initiatives. What do I mean by disruptive? Because we know that the health system has never served black and brown people equi equitably in this country. Hard stop, that is the issue. But as Dr. Avila said, it's not our problem. It's the system's problem. It's your problem. It, it is a white problem as the Kerner report stated in 1968. It is not a black problem because the systems were not created to accommodate us in a way that's sufficient. So there are things that are non-clinical in terms of awareness and training, uh, creating affinity spaces, peer-to-peer -peer support, uh, where wellness and cultural empowerment initiatives. These are the things that we are working on uh, within the Alliance um, to, to be able to move the needle, if you will. Some of the other things, and here you see leveraging data. We also have a data team. If you go out to our website, you'll see just uh, volumes of data on uh, policing, race, traffic, stop, use of force, COVID-19. So we, 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 are, we have become a repository too as well. Uh, so, but this data is informing the work that we're doing here. Uh, we, we've uh, 
We've used some of this work to contribute to the ACT, the statewide policy, which is why you saw H210 uh, come forward. Because the what we know is is that um, equity in healthcare is very important. Um, but it's also why you saw other policies come forward, um, quite frankly, when you start thinking about um, those policies that relate to economic development, cultural empowerment, those policies um, that relate to even, you know, cannabis equity and, you know, as far as taxation and regulation in the market, it's also, um, that's also why. Uh, I want to go on to um, talk just a little bit about some other activities that we're, we are undertaking. Um, is, is currently, we're, we're leaning into the creation of a strategic plan. We're, we're developing that consensus and creating a framework for, for a proposal of a strategic plan because we, what we understand is there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. And we want to be partners. We want to be a part of the, we want to be a part of the solution and, and not just keep calling out the problem. So we've got just an, a, just a whole network of partners that we're working with because we are an active member of this uh, alliance of organizations that are here in this community, here in the Burlington and the greater uh, Chittenden County area. And you know what we thought it just made sense. It just makes sense that if if the state, because you know what we what we know is is the state is not Burlington and Burlington is not the state. It makes sense that if we had a similar effort, if we had similar commitment, if we had half the commitment across the state in doing this kind of work, um, you know, I believe that you know we would see just just a tremendous level of progress uh, in the work that we. I know that we're all committed uh, to getting done. So that's that's how we came full circle uh, on um, determining that yes, you know, a resolution. Um, a joint resolution in the legislature is, is probably the way to go because what we could do with this is, is we could really motivate a lot of other folks to kind of dial in because sometimes it's just hard, you know, to just say, what's the most important thing we can be doing right now? And, you know, what's determining that? But when you, when you make that commitment, when we made this commitment here, what we said was, uh, we said, you know, yes, we're going to stand behind this. And, and yeah, folks have, you know, we have called each other out, you know, talking on the phone or something. And it's like, well, I thought it was an emergency. Ah, I see what you did there. So uh, there's that as well as to be able to make that commitment to acknowledge, as I said, with ACNT, um, to make a, a public acknowledgement that what we're doing is just that important and it's just that urgent. So I'm going to, you know, again, stop here. And hopefully what we can do is, is, you know, get some other questions if you have them. If, not, if nothing else, um, in, our in our conclusion, um, you know, take you to a place where you can maybe get a break before your next, um, your, your next witness. Because you've been sitting in place for a while, too. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a, we have a question from Representative uh, Rosenquist. Thank yes, you sir. very much, Mr. Hughes. I'm a very uh, animated and strong presentation. I appreciate many of the things you said. I'm just, and I know you, you, uh, you've made a case against what I'm just about ready to say anyway already, but I just think uh, the, if, if this resolution said that it, uh, racial disparities are a public health emergency, I think you'd get 100% agreement. When, when you bring in racism, because of the connotation of the word and the, and the fact that it causes in our society today still, for whatever reason, a certain amount of separation and uh, uh, between groups. I, I just think it, it, uh, it does harm to the overall resolution. I think mm -hmm. most of us could agree on all the things that are brought up on all the warehouses and all that, that th those are uh, public health emergency and we need to deal with them. And I just think by using the term racism and the connotation that goes along with it, 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 it divides us instead of bringing us together, which I think is the aim that we all want to do is to come together. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and that's, um, it's, it's, it, it's an interesting observation, in it, but it's not a surprising one. Um, I think that, um, you know, what, where we've come to is, is we've come to a place to where um, 
here's the scenario. Here's how it plays out is, is um, quite often it's been my experience where I've heard a, um, I've just basically been gaslit, quite frankly. And, um, and I've, I've, you know, I've heard a, you know, some kind of dog whistle or something, you know, say, well, those people, you know, were, if, if they, if they weren't coming in our country, then there'd be more, you know, space in our schools. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So I, I might say, well, you know what? That's really a racist statement. That's, that's not a, it's, it's not a, you know, that, that policy is racist. Um, and then usually I get the response of what? And, and, and then after that, um, I try to push it and they say, well, they say, well, I'm, I'm not a racist. So it becomes about them personally. And then finally, if I push it any further, they'll ultimately just spin the whole thing around and call me a racist. But that's a whole other conversation. But that's usually how it plays out. I've, I've seen it a thousand times. And I think that the reason why I, I play that scenario out is, is because we spend far too much time as a nation, nation being worried about being um, accused of being a racist. Uh, in fact, nothing that I've said has anything to do with anybody being a racist. It has everything to do with uh, the question of systemic racism, which has nothing to do with individuals. It has everything to do with systems. And as Dr. Avila, and this is really representative of Rosenquist respectfully, it's, it's, a, it's a really great teachable moment. And it's a really a great opportunity for us, not just here and now, but the process, the whole process that we're talking about right now, because I can guarantee you, sir, there's other folks who feel like you. In fact, even on this call right now, and folks who are watching, it's I just I just really appreciate the honesty, the candor, the transparency, and and also, and maybe I'm giving myself too too much credit, but creating a space or being involved in a space where you felt it was appropriate or safe to have this conversation. Thank you for that. But I think that, you know, this conversation is a really important one because you are right, sir. There are there are people who will ask that question and who will take that and personalize it and say, wait a minute, we're not racist here. And this is much easier to and palatable for us if you don't say racism is a public health emergency. But the flip side of that is the opportunity for us to have these conversations and to delineate racism, systemic racism from overt racism, to be able to make it clear in our education and in our understanding of the issues that we're trying to resolve here, that there is a difference, that, that, that you, can be, you can be in a system of racism, but not necessarily be racist. You know, I quoted to you a book of racist America because what 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 Tom Fagan, with um, what Joe Fagan and Kimberly Ducey is saying is 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 basically America is racist. Uh, and if if you if you take a nation and you build it on uh, genocide and slavery, I would imagine they're probably not far off from the truth. So I think that um, I as much as I appreciate what you say, I want to push back a little bit on it and also just. Uh, extended as an opportunity for this committee right now. And I'm happy to come back to this committee as well and, and have more of these conversations um, because I think it's important for us to be having these conversations. Um, but I think it's an opportunity for us to learn and grow uh, and also to extend that opportunity um, to a broader community, maybe the full, the full uh, legislature, um, hopefully the state as a whole. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Thank you. And let me um, look and see what other uh, comments or questions that we have right now. Looks okay. like you get a break. Uh, not quite. Not <laughs> quite. It's the three. Um, it's the three second or three, you know, to count <laughs> three times and then uh, Representative Redmond. Hi, Representative hey. Redmond. Hi, Mark. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I promise it's it's fairly quick. Um, I just want to um, uh, kind of ask a question that was asked previously of our witness, which is, 
is there anything in the resolution that, um, you know, you feel is problematic or, um, you know, having looked at it, I know that you were very involved in the um, legislation around uh, H210 and really appreciate that. But I just wondered if there was anything we should um, look at more closely or, you know, anything we sh we've missed here. To be clear, we wrote this. Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, so we're, I'm here to support it and I probably should have said that when I started is, is I, I came to support this, uh, this, uh, this resolution, this joint resolution. Uh, I've had, I've been in conversations with the president pro tem at, as well as the speaker. Um, you know, we've, you know, we participate in the, as you know, the social equity caucus. We've had um, many conversations about this. And I, I think that um, what I'd highlight um, is a couple of things is number one is, is that uh, collectively or on aggregate, uh, when you look at each one of these warehouse as clauses and you, you pull them all together and I'm, I know um, every member of this committee has already read this, but it, it kind of knocks you back in your seat a little bit. Um, when you when you put all of these 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 things together, and there's so much more. Uh, when you when you start to read our policy, the policy that was put forward um, by us on economic development, the policies on health services, there are portions of some of this language, but there's we haven't. This is <laughs> this is light. This is and I think um, Mercedes uh, Dr. Avilia uh, had indicated it. So that's the first thing is is that. We realize that you know that this is this is really even in its limited form is a shell shocker uh, for somebody who just picks this up, especially a legislator, um, because truthfully, you just don't see this in the same. You don't you don't see stuff like this every day. I just want to say that. I mean, you don't you don't see stuff like this every day. And um, I see Representative Noyes kind of laughed a little bit there, but if, I think you'd agree. It's so true because you pick this up and you start reading and, and you get through the first clause and you start persistence of health inequities. And then you're talking about determinants and then you're getting into, you know, all of these stats and it kind of blows you away. And I just want you to know that that's what we want to do. That's, that was the intention. It wasn't, it, it was specifically designed to, to, in, to really imprint upon us the, the stark reality of what it is that we're dealing with. It is so important that we address this as a stark reality. It is so important for us, even if it doesn't feel comfortable, let's work through it, but it's real. It's real. And I think that, again, there's three, three things that are happening here, Representative Redmond. Personal growth, organizational growth, and then there's that collective and societal growth that's happening. That's why we're here. And it's, if, it's my hope, if nothing else happens, let's just say you guys say, ah, oh, that guy's crazy, you know, just table it, put it back on the wall, get him out of here or whatever. Bottom line, I doubt that happens, but I'm just saying, if, if nothing else happens on this resolution, we've already accomplished something today. So I think, so that's the first thing. Um, the, sec the, the second thing and la final thing I'll, I'll just share with you is, is these resolutions were pretty well thought out, you know, as far as not just calling out the resolution, but you notice that um, there is um, a commitment. I know it's just words, but words, as somebody said earlier, matter. Words matter. And I think that there's here a, a sustained and deep, uh, it commits to a sustained and deep work uh, work in eradicating systemic racism through um, throughout the state, actively fighting racist practice, so on and so forth. And then the, the, the last part is, is who's going to actually get a copy of this? You know, we thought, we thought that out in terms of, you know, in extending, you know, as an olive branch to the executive branch, to the legislative, uh, to the um, judicial, judi judiciary branch to say, hey guys, look what we're doing. You know, maybe you might want to be a part of this. So, uh, that was the long answer. The short answer is, is you know, we've edited this thoroughly. Um, it has been through multiple iterations uh, and um, we're happy to engage in, you know, discussion on, um, you know, any type of, uh, I guess, recommendations for um, modification of language. And we'd be happy to come back and, and provide additional testimony if necessary. 
Thank you. Super helpful. I just wanted to have that be clearly established and you did. Thank you. Thank Repres you. Representative McFawn has a question. Hi, Representative McFawn. How are you doing? Pretty good. Thanks. Good. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Here's my question. What do, what do you think you accomplished today? You mentioned you've already accomplished something. What have you accomplished today? I what we what we're able to first of all you you have taken up for the first time in history a joint resolution declaring racism as a public health emergency first time in history of in 244 years of this legislative body this is the first time this has ever happened that's the first thing that we've accomplished today uh, the second thing that we've accomplished today is, is we've had an open communication about systemic racism, racism and systemic racism in your committee, um, specifically for that purpose. Uh, and I think, and hopefully, hopefully, and, this, and this, this can only come from you, is, is there may have been some things that committee members have learned regarding, if nothing else, the difference between systemic racism and overt racism in this conversation. So I think those are some of the things that I, I believe I feel really good about uh, in terms of accomplishments. Uh, does that help uh, Representative McFawn? Absolutely. I just wanted to give you a forum. I appreciate you. <laughs> I, it's not often I get a bone thrown in. <laughs> um, Mr. Hughes, I wanna thank you um, and I wanna um, Hope you will express to the folks who uh, you worked with in creating the resolution um, that uh, we we thank them for giving us this opportunity to look at things. Um, and this is not the um, not the only day. This is the first day um, we will be um, at looking at this. We will be. Um, uh, managing this along with a couple of other pieces of legislation um, that we have. Um, so rather than doing it um, all on one day or um, all on three days together, we will be um, mixing it up with other pieces of legislation. Madam Chair, um, I, I appreciate having had the opportunity to come. I, I appreciate all of the um, brilliant and insightful questions, and it's, it's so good to see uh, the members of the committee. I also want to just give a special shout out, Madam Chair, to Julie Tucker, who coordinated so hard to get me here and, and all of the work that she's doing on the back end of the committee. Uh, and I, the, I think the final thing I would just say to the committee is, is thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, considering this policy and taking it up. Thanks for treating it like a bill, because I think that slows it down. And it gives you an opportunity to take a close look at it, to think about it, to process it. Uh, I believe that at the end of the day, you're going to come to the conclusion that this is the thing that is the best uh, for the state. Uh, I think the Senate's going to agree with you. And I'm excited about what's going to happen after that. So I wish you all a great weekend. I'm getting ready to hop on a plane tomorrow to the West Coast. But um, I wish you all a great weekend. And, and thank you for having me. Well, uh, thank you. And I do offer, if you wish um, to uh, submit um, any of those slides, uh, Julie will um, post them for us so that we can look at them more closely. Absolutely. I appreciate okay. you. Thank Have a great you. day. Thank you. Um, Bye. Committee, it looks like we have about um, five minutes to uh, take a break before uh, the Commissioner of Health is expected to be here. <laughs> 